This year is the 50th anniversary of a major event. Anybody know what that is? Somebody say Woodstock, you're correct, but <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> the moon landing. 1969 in July was the month before Woodstock of all things, but uh, I, I, had, I baited you for that, I really did. <laughs> You know, man, man has gone to great lengths to try to know and understand it all. And we have this quest for knowledge of what we can accumulate and what we can know, what we can understand. Um, unfortunately, mankind also wants to experience a lot of things that they know, which is not the best, which leads us to where we are in society and in the world today with all the problems we've got. Um, if we just have, have a problem along those lines. We try to understand the earth. Man has always wanted to learn more and know more. There's nothing wrong with that. It's built into us. It's something God created us within us to know, to understand, to desire, to realize where we came from, what is happening, what is going on, and what, what will take place, you know, in a few years down the road. Um, you know, we've always already been told we're going to, you know, be gone in 12 years because climate change and all the other things. <laughs> but, you see, we, people have, have neglected God within their lives. They don't want anything to do with God. We know we, we are great about everything else in life and in society and in the world and in the universe. And when you look at some of these programs on TV, you know, Cosmos, Nova, uh, the new program, I think it's out, it's called Blue Planet. My wife watches that off and on. And, and if I'm in there, I usually watch it. And, and some of the things are phenomenal of what they have been able to uncover and understand and see with Voyager, the spacecraft that is still traveling, you know, on out into, you know, the universe. Um, you know, I grew up learning that Pluto was the last planet, and now it doesn't even exist as a planet, supposedly. So I have to go back and change my history because, and my science, because of what they have found and uncovered. Uh, and there's so many other things out there that they have, have been able to, you know, find and, and to have. And to have a Mars rover land on Mars and send back some of the photos it, it did is, is just incredible. And when you think of some of these programs with the Hubble telescope and some of the pictures that, that are able to be seen that are just stunning, and then you find out that this was something that existed, you know, 80,000 light years ago and doesn't even exist anymore. We're just seeing the light from it. Um, your mind just kind of explodes because you can't comprehend it. And uh, we have enough trouble thinking about a line going from east to west and never meeting. That's about all we can comprehend when it comes to infinity. And yet there's so much out there. You know, we, we understand there's thousands, maybe millions of galaxies. Who knows how big it is? What's interesting about it is the only place we find life is on this planet. And again, if you would go back and get people to read the Bible, they wouldn't be so concerned about spending so much money on what is out there because it's all going to happen here, which is what it's all about. I want to mention a book to you you might want to read. Uh, it's a man from Louisiana I just picked up Thursday morning, and uh, you probably know him, Phil Robertson. And his new book is The Theft of America's Soul. And uh, I'm not a one that reads a lot of books. I read half of it Thursday night and Friday morning. It's only 200 pages long, but it is well stated as to what our problem is, not only here in this country, but in the world. And it's... Uh, it's interesting. You'll, you'll find it interesting. He preaches the gospel in a way that only somebody as famous can do because people are going to look to him with a certain amount of respect and want to see what he has to say. Very good. But he talks about that very thing, the fact that we have neglected involving ourselves with God. And we've done that as people. You know, when you look at the earth and when you look at what God has done throughout the universe, we don't have to look much further than just the earth to see what amazing things there are. Because when you take the planet earth and you just think of the orbit, the way it revolves around the sun, the position of where it is, the tilt of the earth, the atmosphere that we have, the ozone layer that keeps the damaging rays from the sun out. When you, when you consider the distance we are from the sun, which makes the temperature of this planet just perfect for us to live on, here in East Texas and 
Louisiana sometime the summer, July and August are pretty darn hot, uncomfortable, but we can live with it. Um, but it, it, it gives us something to understand as to how precise this earth really is. And when we look at God's creation, what's involved with it, because scientists will tell you that, that should one of these things be altered in the slightest in regards to planet earth, things would change dramatically. And, you know, we understand that. But why they don't understand that it took a God to create that is beyond me sometimes. Their, their own reasoning, you know, short circuits in their mind, and they want to go on and say, well, there is no God. This is the way it took place. One of the things that we deal with in life today is almost identical to what the Apostle Paul dealt with when he was walking through the streets of Athens, as mentioned in the book of Acts. You know, you can put yourself in, in Paul's shoes and see him walking through the streets of this very progressive city, very modern city for the time, that had everything you could imagine. And Paul is looking at all the gods and the statues of different gods with the names of them as he walked down the street. And he comes to the one, as you well know, that is called the unknown God. And so he begins to deliver to them a little address as to who the unknown God is. Because ancient people were pretty particular about making sure they didn't leave any God out because that's what their future was all about. Their survival was to make sure that they worshiped the gods and gave sacrifices to them so that the gods would, would be pleased with them. So Paul told them about the unknown God. You know, we are not that much different today in society in dealing with God with a lot of people. They don't know God. And I don't know how many times over the last few years, and this is not an exaggeration, but I hear all the time People will say, well, that scripture is not in the Bible. Where did you come up with that? And you bring it out and you show it to them. And they'll say, I've studied the Bible and gone to church a lot in my life, but I don't, I've never seen this scripture. Nobody's ever told it to me. Well, figure that out. And as Phil Robertson said, if, Phil, if people would just read their Bible and give a little attention to it, this whole world would change. Not just America, but this world would change and be different. And that's what we try to do. We try to tell people about the Word of God. We try to tell people about what is happening and what is taking place and what is going on in society and what people can expect in the future. And it's all a mystery to them. They've never heard some of this stuff. You know, they think that when you die, you go to heaven. Yet Jesus said, no man has ascended up to heaven except he which came down from heaven. So go figure that out. You know, we, how can we make things so complex when things are really quite simple? Doesn't make a lot of sense. I want to read a couple little sentences from you, for you from an article that I came across about the human eye. We're going to talk about God, what he has done, what God is, and what he is doing. And we're going to discuss three aspects of what God is. The designer, the creator, and the sustainer of his creation. Because that's what life is all about. That's what mankind needs to know and understand. This article I came across was from May 15th in 2013. It's an interesting article. It's about a doctor, Dr. Doug Borkman, who is teaching at the University of Louisville, Kentucky. Been there for over 25 years. He's been studying the human eye for 30 years. He was from Detroit, and he came, came from Detroit, and he was an atheist, because he had something like over 50 to 60 people a year killed within a five-mile radius of his home. He had another 150 to 200 who were assaulted, and he had friends and family who had been assaulted and killed, and, and problems they had to deal with. And his overall thought was, if God is going to allow something like this to happen, there can't be any God. And so he became an atheist. Well, lo and behold, when he became a, a doctor and began studying the human eye, things changed. Of all things, he began to understand that when you look at the complexities of some of these things, that it didn't just happen by chance. That it wasn't just going to develop on its own. No way. He said, I'm in awe of some of the things I see. It's too beautiful every day I go to work to unlock the mystery of the eye. 
And I've, I've heard some of this before, but it's amazing as to what this is all about. He became a Christian several years ago and began to, to use what he understood about the human eye to try to help people realize that because of the complexity of, complexities of it, that there could not be the development of the human eye through evolution. It had to be through a creator. It's too precise. He said, I believe God gave us science to show he exists. 100 years ago, we didn't have the tools to see all this. Science tells us there must be something else. It takes an intelligent designer to produce the level of complexity in our world. And you and I understand that, and you and I have that opportunity to share that with other people. You know, when you get into the human eye, when you get into the way the earth rotates and its orbit and tilts and all the complexities about it, to change that just dramatically in a, in a minute way would change everything there is. He says here that if the cornea, the lens, the retina, the nerves, connections are ridiculously complex, there is so much to know. For an eye to be able to see, all the basic components must be present at the same time and work together perfectly. For instance, if all the other components, such as the cornea, iris, pupil, retina, and eye muscles, are all present and functioning properly, but just the eyelid is missing, then the eye will incur serious damage, dry up, and blindness would quickly ensue. So just your eyelid, you know, we blink our eyes approximately 10,000 times a day. Try holding your eyes open for a minute. It just doesn't happen. Anyway, to, make, to go on what he was saying, he showed here and quoted somebody from the past in history who was a scientist of what this man understood back in the mid-1800s. And I quote this man, that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. That is a direct quote from Charles Darwin, of all people. But when you have a following because of some of your ideas, the following that you have is much more important than the actual truth of things. In conclusion on this, just to tell you about some of the things here about the human eye, he said, science is not a stumbling block to belief in a creator. Rather, it tells us there must be something else. What's incredible is this God wants a great, this great creator God wants to have a relationship with us. And he truly does. And you and I have that opportunity to tell people about it. The eye has more than two million working parts. The human eye is capable of seeing at a resolution of 576 megapixels. Corneas are the only tissue this, that don't require blood, of all things. The eye can process 36,000 bits of information an hour. The eye blinks approximately 10,000 times a day. Under the right condition, the human eye can see the light of a candle at a distance of 14 miles. The eye can see, this is hard to believe, I didn't know this even existed, the eye can see 2.7 million different colors. Wow. So when you go to a nail salon, just think, <laughs> there's a lot more colors nail polish they're going to come up with. 2.7 million different colors. The eye has about 12 million photoreceptors, light-sensitive cells. The retina contains 130 million rods for night vision and 7 million color-sensitive cones for day vision. When you just read these statistics, as brief as they are, did this happen by evolution? Of course it didn't. Of course it didn't. Let's look at the designer, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. God designed everything. God put all this together. And in some ways, he really didn't fill us in on everything that he did, did he? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do the words of this law. You know, when you look at the secret things that God has done throughout the universe, you can't even comprehend all of it. You know, we know for a fact there were dinosaurs living on this earth before there was a recreation and man was put on it. How long were they here? Was there anything here before the dinosaurs? Is there life out there in the universe? What does God have going on 8,000 light years from earth? 
in his universe that's part of his creation that he designed, that he created and sustains? I don't have the answer. We wonder about a lot of these things. God could have all sorts of things going on throughout the universe. But it doesn't interfere with us. You know why? Because God said this is what our job is, is to learn what's in here because this is what relates to our salvation. And that's what God is most concerned with. He's not willing that any should perish, as Peter said, but that all should come to repentance. And that is what God wants people to understand. So what interferes with us, what is going to interact with us, is primarily on this earth. Now granted, we have to look and understand about the spiritual realm, which is a part that does interact with us and does test us and is a problem for us sometimes unless we can zero in on, on God and keep and follow and stay close to Him. But one of the things that God did when He designed all of this, He didn't have to tell us everything. And He certainly doesn't. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about the kingdom of God and, and in his writings that we see through a glass darkly. It's like a mystery. We just get bits and pieces, not even so much of an outline, just an idea of what God is doing. But it's enough that we know and understand what we need to be doing. So this God who designed all these things that we have questions about tells us to just be patient. There is something coming. And once his kingdom comes, you know, maybe, maybe once we're given eternal life and once we're in his kingdom and once new heaven and new earth comes down from heaven as we read about in Revelation, maybe we'll have spiritual DVDs to plug in and see what history was like before man was created. I don't know. I don't think when we're given eternal life that we're going to know it all, understand it all, and see it all. I think when we have eternal life, I think we're going to be eternal, but we're going to have to grow in grace and knowledge spiritually just like we do physically. Why would God give us eternal life and then give us all power in heaven and earth? I think there's a little bit of a process of growth in there, correct? Yeah. Because that's the way it is in human life. You know, when a child is born, what do they have to do? Well, they just are physical. They're alive. Maybe that's the way it is spiritually. Maybe when we're given eternal life, we're going to be spiritual and be alive for eternity and have to grow like a child does. I don't know, that's just my, something I wondered about because that's a good physical example of what takes place in life. And the things physically that we see and understand help us to understand some of the things spiritually. Of course, that comes also with God's Spirit. When you read about the universe being billions of years old, that's another concept that just staggers the imagination because it's so far beyond what we can comprehend. We always want to know, well, what's out there? What was there before mankind? Doesn't tell us, does it? God says those secret things belong to Him. God could be doing all sorts of things. And when I read in the book of John that this designer is working, as Jesus said, my Father works and I work also, what is God still doing if creation is already taken place. What's he working on? He doesn't tell us. I'm sure he's making preparations for the kingdom because he's going to have his hands full with us, isn't he? We, we've got to learn. We've got to be taught. We've got to become like God. Uh, and trying to do it in this life is, is pretty tough, isn't it? And as you get older, it's even tougher. It really is. And then you begin to realize that your limitations are there and that you are a physical human being. And as Paul said, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So we know there's going to come a time where we are no longer going to be here. You know, I never thought I would reach that point. You know, Don and I back in college, I guarantee you remember that it was all supposed to end in 75. And that was going to be the end of it. But now we both have grandkids and that gets your attention very quickly. As you well know. Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. The creation of God is certainly evident by the things that we see and the things that we are able to understand in the world around us. Do you know how long a light year is? 
I figured this up. A light year is, a, is 11 million miles per hour. So if you figure up how long a light year is and figure that times a year, times, times a day, whatever, that's a long, long way. You know, 11 million miles per hour is how fast light travels and, the, and it never ends in the universe. You know, we can't even understand that. And yet here's God who designed this. How long did it take the designer, the great designer, to design this universe? One day, two days, 100 years? And the Bible says a day is, wor is similar to a thousand years, but God doesn't tell us. God can do all things, but whatever God did, He did perfectly because He designed it in such a way like He did the earth and like the human body not just the eye, but other parts of it, you know, to where we understand and see that there had to be a creator somewhere along the line who designed it so specifically and so perfectly that there are no flaws in it. The flaws are in our human conduct and our human nature. You know, like I said, we want to understand and we want to know everything there is to know about the world, the universe, human beings. But when it comes to God, well, we just kind of put God off to the side on the shelf and we only really want Him when we need Him. That's the way people are. Genesis chapter 1. You don't even need to turn there. But when you look at how God did things, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth became was void and without, became void without form and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. You know, we don't have all the particulars of just how God did that. But what He said, He did, and it took place. And He knew what He was doing when He designed it and put it all together. You know, when you look at the, the, uh, the article on the Internet about the Big Bang Theory, you know, when it talks about how the universe probably began and what it shows science and tells science that uh, this may be the way it took place, you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. When God said what He did, let there be light, I'm sure there was some kind of a Big Bang. And how that developed and took place, I don't know, but God did it. And what happened, happened. When God did that, with mankind, I'm sure it was back about 6,000 years ago, but who knows what He had when He had the dinosaurs. There were plants and animals at that point. There had to be light back then. But the, wor but the world became void and without form at a certain point. So what God did, He did as a designer. He put this all together. And it would be good for people to kind of give God a little thought, a little understanding as to what He's done and what He has taken care of down through the millennia in caring for this world. Because you see, we're still here, aren't we? We haven't been hit by an asteroid that just destroyed the earth. We don't have to worry about there being another flood, do we? Now we may have floods locally, but not to destroy the world. God said He's not going to do that again. You and I understand that. You and I understand it's not going to be global warming that's going to end the world in 12 years. That there are things that have to take place and happen. And God understands what it is that's going to take place. And He knows what He's doing. Genesis chapter 2 talks about God's creation. You know, God put everything together and after the time of creating what He created He took seven days. Why did He take seven days? Why not ten or twelve? It's God's business, not mine. God just tells us what He did. He created everything in six days and then He created the Sabbath on the seventh day and rested from all of His work. I was talking to some people the other day and we were talking about the Sabbath and and they say, well, that was, you know, that was done away with. That was a, a Jewish festival. That is no longer you know, necessary. And I said, have you ever read back in Genesis that God rested on the seventh day? Well, yeah, yeah. I said, well, didn't, didn't God say that that's when He created the Sabbath, was, was on the seventh day when He rested from His work? Well, I never thought of that. I said, well, you know, when He created it back then, I said, there was no Israel. There was no Jew. I said, at that point, there was only Adam and Eve. The man said, 
well, you know, I never thought of this. I said, why, why haven't I ever heard this before? I said, I have no idea. But I said, it's there in the Bible. I said, you can read it. And he said, well, I'm going to have to give this some thought. And I said, well, I wish you would. I said, because the Sabbath was not a Jewish festival. I said, it became a Jewish festival, and it became a festival with Israel. I said, but it was ordained at creation. I won't tell you what he said when I mentioned about unclean meats with Noah. <laughs> He'd never thought about that either. But, but I mean, these things happen. And, and people are so, so rolling along with the current like a, in a boat in a stream that life just kind of pushes you along. And until you make the course correction, that's the way you're going to be going. And that's what we're supposed to be doing is making a course correction as we go through life. And just because we have God's Spirit and just because, you know, we read and understand the Bible, we have to make that same course correction in our life too, don't we? To make sure that we're on the right course that we want to be going. So we're, we're never finished with it. Life is always a challenge. There are always things for us to do. We, we as people like to look at freedom. And we think that we have the freedom and the self-will to do whatever we want. That we can be determined and to accomplish anything and everything and become whatever we want because another statement that I heard a few weeks ago, God is love. He loves everybody. So people can do whatever they want. Oh, really? Well, when you start quoting some other scriptures to them that they've never heard of before, you know, you know, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and the commandments are not grievous. Never heard of that scripture. But I don't know how well they read the Bible. Obviously not very well. But so many people are like that. They go to church, but they don't read the Bible. And as a minister, if you tell people what they have to do, in most of the congregations, most Christian congregations nowadays, they're not going to have a job very long. Because people don't want to be told what they need to do. I mean, we read the Bible, and we don't like to be told through the pages of the Bible what we need to do sometimes. But we know it's right. And that word that comes in mind is we have to change. And that's, that's a challenge. That's something we have to think about. John chapter 1. And again, I'm not giving you any scriptures that you don't already know. But there are a lot of people out there that don't even know these scriptures. Some of the basic ones. And how they can go to church all their lives and not know them is, is sometimes beyond me. John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's pretty specific. You read over in Colossians chapter 1, it's a little, little more in detail than what this scripture is. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul says, in, whom, in verse 14, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, which we're going to be spending a lot of time on in the next few weeks before Passover, that you and I understand. And, and this, is, this is hope for people. The one thing people want and will listen to you about is hope. And we've got that message of hope for them. They can be forgiven of their sins. And they can have a chance to have Jesus as a part of their life. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, earth, visible, and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. That's pretty specific. All things in the heavens were created by Him as well. And it talks about principalities and powers in the heavens. The angelic world as well. You know, there, there was a time when they were created. And of course you know the history of that. One third of them rebelled and went against God and His way. But we see the unseen and the seen. And with God's Spirit we're able to see so much more of that and understand so much more of that than the average person. And I'm so thankful for that every day, I think just as much as you are, because of how important that is to us, to understand the Creator. Not only did He design all this, but He created it. He put it into being, and it happened, and it took place. Romans chapter 1, and we see what we have come to as a society 
by wanting to reject that and wanting to move on and think we as human beings and all of our intellect and our intelligence, all of our knowledge that we have and knowledge at the end time right now in these last days has exploded with the internet. Some of it's true, some of it's not. But the information we have available to us is so amazing. Yet they don't want to understand and learn about God. All we want to do is erase our history, erase God, get the commandments out of the schools, don't bring up God, because if you talk about God, you're, you can become a racist. You know, if you say someone is a sinner, you can become considered a racist. That's the way they do it. It's not really the truth, but that's what they're going to say. You know, we love all human beings, regardless of who they are, regardless of what people know and understand, regardless of their past life. Over the last 38 years of working in the landscape business, I have probably worked with some 500 people that have been made employed with me. And I have learned so much from them over the years, not about God, but about what they don't know about God and about their lives and how their lives are completely messed up. I've been able to help a few of them to turn their lives around, but they have to understand that because of some of the things in their lives, they have so much baggage that can't be erased. You know, it just can't. But I've, I've worked with so many people over the years, I would not trade my experience in what I did as a working in the dirt all my life, because that's really what I did. But, but the experience of working with these individuals helped me to understand people so much better. They are genuine, whether good or bad. And they are driven sometimes to do bad things. And if you can ever get their attention, in the case of a couple that has, where they have turned their lives around and become a Christian, not with the churches of God, but they believe in Jesus Christ and God the Father, and they realize they've made some mistakes. That's, that's what people need to do and learn. And that's what you and I can have a chance and an opportunity to do. You know, I even went to court one time with another gentleman who was this, em this employee's boss. He had two jobs. He worked for me and he worked at Golden Corral at night. Been doing this for eight, nine years. He went to jail, DWI. He served a year and they were going to put him back and they were going to keep him in jail. We got him out because we told the judge what kind of person this person was and we could help him in getting to change. He's still employed. That was about 10 years ago with me. Not with me. I'm retired. My son owns it now. But, but when, when you see people that are, are, are needing help, are needing some counseling, are needing some encouragement and some hope, and you can help them to see that, it can change their lives. And that's what our responsibility is as Christians, is to help other people come to see that they can change their lives with God's help and with the Holy Spirit. And you see, this is, like I said, God's creation. And He is very much concerned about His creation. And the final point is that of God as sustainer. He didn't just design this creation. He didn't create this creation and put it into existence and then walk away from it. That's kind of the deist view of things. You know, God created the world. God put man in his place and then God walked away and said, you're on your own. The rest is up to you. No, we understand so much more of what God is doing and made available to us and what lies beyond. You know, the whole creation, as it says in Romans 8, groans and waiting for that change to take place. I don't know about you, but I'm groaning and waiting for that to happen. I wish it would happen today. I wish they'd cut my sermon short and just say, that's it, Jesus Christ returns. That's what we're waiting for. But it hasn't happened yet. God sustains His creation. He mentions that to us in Genesis chapter 3. You'll probably hear more about this in the next week or two, about what our Savior did. Genesis 3 verse 15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God talking to the serpent. Between your seed and her seed, it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This was the illustration of the plan of God, of what God was going to do for his creation. 
to sustain it, to allow death to be overcome with victory. And that is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Everything, and this is a sermon in itself, but you'll hear, hear enough about this in the next few weeks. All of these things that God has done to sustain his creation is through Jesus Christ. The God who we read about designed and created all things with his Father. And he's very much concerned about this. This program that we come into view here in Genesis chapter 3 helps us to understand what God was doing. God had to kind of short circuit things along the way, didn't he? By the flood, because things got so bad. I think it's hard for us to understand, it is for me anyway, how that after just a 1,500 years or so after the beginning of creation, God had to destroy everything on earth except Noah and his family because it had gotten so bad. When I look at things today, we live in a relatively good part of the world, all things considered. We got major problems, don't get me wrong, but we live in a good part of the world. We have freedom. We can meet here in peace and safety for the most part. But how much worse could it have been back then in Genesis when God had to destroy the earth with a flood? I can't comprehend that. Can you? We got some pretty horrible things in some pretty horrible parts of the world. And even though that would be all over the world, I don't think, in my opinion, it would be that bad to destroy the entire world. But God evidently saw something that had to happen. But nevertheless, it happened. And God had a plan in place. And God had something that was going to take place that we sometimes have a hard time talking about, and that is the birth of our Savior. Because, and I'll just briefly mention this because for the sake of time, it says, And the Word became flesh, John 1 verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How does, how do we, we comprehend the fact of a God coming down here and becoming flesh and blood and starting out as a baby, vulnerable? He didn't start out as a teenager or as an adult. He started out as a little baby who basically all he was was alive. And he had to learn to walk and talk and eat and, and learn what life was all about and, and to be filled with knowledge. Um, that is a concept that's hard to, hard to imagine him becoming flesh and blood. But he was willing to do it for you and me. And for the people out there in the world. You know, it says, for God so loved the world. You know, he didn't love just people that are part of the churches of God. They can't get along sometimes with each other. He loves the entire world. Some of those horrible people that have come down through the ages who have murdered people. Jesus Christ died for them as well. And someday those people will have that opportunity to understand to know their designer, creator, and sustainer. And there are a few people along the way that you and I will have a chance to put them in touch with the sustainer. And maybe their lives will change a little bit. You know, God calls people, and sometimes He calls people through you and me, and in our conversations with people, that maybe gets their attention Maybe they don't become converted all at once. Maybe that's years down the road. But if you talk to somebody about something and three or four years later it finally hits them and they begin to learn and read and be baptized, you've done your job. Don't be discouraged when you talk with people and they don't convert overnight or next week. Give it time. But you and I are those spokesmen that God has decided this is how He's going to do things, through people. You know, and you'll learn about your calling more at the time of Pentecost, of why we're here, of what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes, if you don't like talking with people, just be a good example, because that gets their attention. You know, they'll see the way you live your life. They'll see you're not perfect, but they'll see that you're confident about things, that you are positive about life. That, yeah, we've got a lot of problems. We can complain about politics. We can complain about government. We can complain about all sorts of things. But you ever, did you ever think that God sustains His creation by government? 
I don't have time to turn there, but write down 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. What was it that God said he was going to do to the prophet Samuel? He told Samuel, he said, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And in chapter 8, the rest of chapter 8, he tells what's going to happen to them when they have a king. And how sometimes it's not going to be very pleasant. But they rejected God and they wanted a king. And so how did God deal with the people of Israel for about 400 years? Through kings who were horrible. Horrible. You think we have problems now in government. It was pretty messy back then. If, if you don't believe me, go back and read the book of Kings and Chronicles. I mean, they had relatives, friends killed because they didn't want competition. They were not good people. Most of those kings, kings of Israel were all bad. Kings of Judah, there were only a couple that were good. And yet God said they were going to have this because they had rejected him. And so what was that king? That king was government. And what did Daniel say in his prophecy in Daniel 2? Babylon would be the first. This was after the people of Egypt who had been destroyed in the flood. But he, God said, this is what's going to take place down through history. Babylon, Greece, Medo-Persia, Rome, all the kingdoms that were going to be within the earth. What was that for? Well, that was because there needed to be a certain amount of law and order within the world because the world had rejected God. Even God's own people had rejected Him. Down in just a couple more scriptures before we conclude. Psalm chapter 75. This just kind of shows how that God does deal in, in society. How that He does deal in the world. Not every time somebody is put in a, in a position of power has God stepped in and done it. But every now and then God does do some things. God says in, through, the, through uh, David in Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7, For promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and sets up another. You know, every now and then God does intervene and God does do things. Isaiah 45, remember the man by the name of Cyrus, who was a king of Medo-Persia? He was God's instrument. He didn't know God. Chapter 45 is a great chapter to read. He says, you don't know me, but I've appointed you, and you're going to be in this position, and you're going to send my people back to build a temple after they leave captivity from Babylon, because Medo-Persia had taken over Babylon. And this poor guy, he was a famous king, didn't even know God. Didn't matter to God. God just said, this is what you're going to do. He may even try to understand why he was doing some of these things. But God said, this is the way it's going to be. So yes, God does do that. One scripture that you see in the book of Philippians. Just a couple more and then we'll conclude. The one who sustains this creation, Jesus Christ, we're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, through the Apostle Paul, he said, Let this mind be in you which was in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Could you imagine what it must have been like to be God? To do what all he has done and then to become a human being and to hurt to bleed to make friendships to have people die as in the case of Lazarus to know that he was going to have to die and give up his life for all of us he didn't come in the 20th century to have all the conveniences that we have he came in a time where everything was very primitive still. It was a tough time to be God and come down to the physical life, wasn't it? But He did it for you and for me. To sustain that creation that He created from the very beginning. Because of His love for you and for me 
and for everybody else that's out there that may hate us and may hate him. That's a concept to, to have to think about a little bit. It just doesn't come naturally. When somebody wrongs you and hates you, it's pretty tough to love somebody in those terms, isn't it? Yet yeah, that's what my Bible says about Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 in conclusion. We could read in chapter 5 about, or chapter 4 verse 15 about him being tempted like on all points like as we are yet without sin. And that's true he was, but I think sometimes the depth of, of, the depth of being tempted is far greater than anything we could ever imagine because usually when we're tempted enough what happens? We sin. We just do. It's unfortunate. Jesus Christ was tempted, but He never sinned. And so the depth of that temptation was stronger and stronger and stronger every time He was tempted until He was killed, until He died. And it was over. He was victorious. He had conquered death. He became the firstborn among many brethren. And those of us that are going to have that opportunity later on will understand what He's talking about. I can understand the Apostle Paul when he talked about being transported up to the third heaven to hear things that human beings shouldn't see and understand. And then he couldn't even write about them. It was so astonishing. Yeah, there's, there's so much more out there that we don't even know, but in time we will understand that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that He should offer Himself often as, as the high priest did by entering into the holy place with the blood of others, for then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So how does he sustain his creation? by that sacrifice of Jesus Christ who had no sin, who purified the heavens and everything that there is on this earth with His life and His sacrifice so that everybody could come to know God, could come to understand God and have a chance to repent and be forgiven. And that, my friends, is a message that you and I have an opportunity to share with so many people. The message of hope that no matter what they've gone through, what they've done in life, they can be forgiven. Amen. And they can be blessed with that opportunity of having the prospect of eternal life just like you and me. Maybe not at the same time, but it will happen. And so as we think about the creation, think about especially how that was sustained by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Savior.